Hi everybody, today we've got Chris Basham, who is a, I'm going to say Chris, a utility player at Sheffield United, is that about right? Yeah. Yeah, more utility. Well, over the last four years, I think I've stabled myself in a position this year more than ever. So, yeah, I would say a right side centre half utility player if, if needed. Fab, yeah, we still, unfortunately, at this moment in time, we don't get to watch your match of the day too often. But um, we, we've certainly followed your career over the last sort of 10, 15 years in terms of what you've done. And um, you, you've done phenomenally well. And if I just take everybody through, and we go back to Gator College when you were there. And I yeah. believe you were released at Newcastle United before you went to Gateshead? Yeah, released at 16 and then it was big decision making time really. Was it to stay in football, stay in sport or was it to go and be a builder or something like that? And I think uh, with the drive that I've got, like we spoke about that, it was something that I wanted to do was carry on in my sport and carry on playing football as well. Fab, good. And, and that whole drive you mentioned there and this mental resilience is some of the stuff that I, I just want to have a chat with you about today because... Some people have it quite inbuilt, but some people have to manufacture it in order for them to progress and develop as well. So you made the conscious decision, I'm going to hang in, I'm going to stay in football, I'm going to go and work with Bryce at Gator yeah. at the time. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, Paul Bryson is now at Sunderland's Academy still, isn't he? Yeah, he's at Sunderland Academy. I've seen him a couple of about four or five months ago now and we still just had a catch up about football and that's all we ever talked about really. And yeah, he's at Sunderland now. So I think he's enjoying it there. I think he probably still misses the man's football of the Gateshead College looking after the boys there. But yes, football still, he's, it's got it in, in blooded in him as well. Yeah, I certainly don't think, and I've seen Bryce a couple of times over the years since he left and he, he hasn't changed much. And I've done some stuff with the academy too, especially when Jed McNamee was there and bumped into him a couple of times. And yeah. he just loves football, doesn't he? Yeah, definitely. I think that's the it's credit to him that he's carried on so long and he's gone through so many. Been, he's probably coached so many lads over his time and only the fair few make it to, obviously, positions that I'm in and a few more of, uh, have, have travelled abroad as well. So it's great for him to see boys aspiring and doing well through through him and the college itself as well. Bob, so let's take you back to Gator College days. Um, you're you're at, a, at a college. You've got to do some academics. How well yeah. did that go? Uh, the academic side, because I was young and a bit more immature, it wasn't great until now I'm older and now I start to realise why I did all this stuff and why using your body in sport is so much more important than dietitians and things like that. And I think now I'm using it more than ever because I am 32 year old. You need to look after your body massages and things like that. And back in the day, it wasn't all that driven me was to play football three times a week and play on a, week, a weekend as well. So now I'm in the situation where I'm used to doing that now, but back then that's all I wanted to do was kick a ball about. Yeah, Fab, I'm not sure if you saw my um, little little post yesterday, but the All England Wimbledon Championship age groups have been cancelled for this year. So I bought my new grass court tennis shoes, ready for the year, just new new age category and that's it. The dream is now over again for another year. Yeah, I think that's obviously, it's upset so many people. I think not having sport and not, not being able to do what you're used to doing, uh, that's why it's killed. It's killed a lot of people's momentum and dreams as well. So, it's, yeah, I can imagine how you feel. I'm, I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs. It's great that I've got a family, but some boys haven't. And I think that's, that's when it becomes a bit more deep inside your mind of what's going on. Man, I am happy to say that at my age, I'm quite comfortable not playing anymore, but... You know, you see, yeah, I think it's there a little bit, you know. My, of course, you do. My twenty-year-old ego still still thinks I can play a little bit. Yeah, it's that competitive side of you that you think you'll always have, and I think, like we spoke about before, it's something that you want to take on to the next level, and you want you like teaching people, you like being in a situation, and I think that's it's it's like nurturing somebody into what you've already got. It's great to have. Fab, so you're at Gator College and you, you're playing for just a college football team. Um, you've got your own personal drive and ambition to do something more. You've got a really good coach alongside you in Bryce. But I guess the tipping point moment came when Sam Sam came at Bolton and you went down to see him. How did that yeah, go? Yeah, that, that was the main thing. I think I had done two years at Gator College and I was coming with the end of a spell there. Do I go to university? Don't really want to do that now. I'm a bit fed up with doing the academic side, do I want to go and I want to carry on the sport? And then I got Bolton Wanderers, uh, Bryce that helped us out a bit as well, and they gave us a call and said, do you want to come down for a trial? Not on Tracy's door, so I need to go 
yeah, and she was obviously brilliant with me and uh, seeing what I had done for the college and everyone was giving us high fives on my way out to trial and hopefully uh, it was going to go really well for us and I'm glad it did. My dad pushed us and drove us on to make sure I did it because I was a bit scared about leaving home at 18 years old. I didn't really want to go and live with somebody else so it was a tough decision but I got pushed and pushed. <laughs> Fab, yeah, and, and, and different levels, it's really weird, isn't it? Because I went to the States at 18 to play tennis um, and yeah. you're going down to Boulder. And I think that's one of the things we don't necessarily prepare our younger athletes for is that transition because we're used to hitting balls or kicking balls or throwing balls, but all of a sudden you're not as good when you're 5,000 miles, 7,000 miles, or yeah. even 25 miles away from home. It, yeah. It's just different, isn't it? Definitely, you're on about 5,000 miles. I think I cried my eyes out for about an hour and a half, and I was there in Bolton. It was like it was a bit of a blur, but I think it's because I was so used to it and being 18 years old of living in me, living in myself, going out and socialising with my friends, having a pint that was all going to stop. So it was a bit of a, a bit of a wow step back feeling, but going into the unknown as well. Like you say, it's it's not a nice feeling. You don't get prepared for it. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because um, I think most people would be reluctant to turn around and say that they're homesick and cry. But I was stuck in Tennessee and we didn't have Zoom. We didn't have FaceTime. Yeah. You know, we had one of those old-fashioned telephones. Yeah, that's the one. We used, used to ring around. home once, once every week or once every two weeks and that was it. Yeah, I was the same digs where I stayed as well. The lady didn't have internet, so I had phone credit and I could only afford what I could, could, could have on my phone and just basically go from there and had a girlfriend who's my wife now as well, so I was leaving her and she pushed us all the way, but we both didn't drive and we had train tickets and that was it. Oh, brilliant. And again, that's that mental resilience that we yeah. have to go through. And, and some people, and, I, and you, you will know as well, and I've known loads of people who just don't have that. Um, and they, they quit, they drop out. You know, it's, it's tough being a professional sports person. And that's certainly something that you've done really well with in, over the, the last, what, decade now how long have you been in professional football yeah I, i've been a professional now for i think 11 to 12 years now so and obviously being a scholar i was a scholar for two years with bolton uh so yeah it's been going a long time but like you say mental the mental side of it you don't really know until obviously you get a little bit older that you do realize that you are resilient you can say no and you can also see see what the future can hold and it's all down to you and pushing yourself to try and get the way you need to be yeah, I certainly think with that whole mindset thing, and, and I spend a lot of my time working in that over the last sort of decade myself with a variety of athletes and business people and coaches, is that we just don't spend enough time with it. We have some people who have it built in and it comes natural and they quite like it. And then there's other people who are just a little bit nervous, frightened of it, don't understand it, scared of it. And I've always said, well, actually, if it's the one thing that takes you from A to B, why would you not? Why would you not use something to help you? As you mentioned before about nutrition, that helps yeah. some people. Technical coaches help some people, but also performance psychology helps some people as well. And it's about doing what's yeah. best for you. Yeah, definitely. And even now, we've been locked down for six, seven weeks, and I'm still having to get through the mental side of going out to train by yourself, getting on a walk bike and spinning away. But you're thinking, where's the end goal? But obviously, you know, you hope you're going to go back to reality soon, but it's still... It's mentally draining as well. I don't like putting a bin bag on and sweating and dripping, but it's something that hopefully you can get your mind around it and do it. And it's, it's another mental block in your head that you need to try and get through it at this moment in time. Okay, so how, how are the clubs supporting you at this moment in time in terms of your, your personal programme? Have you got set targets that you need to reach? Yeah, just every week we get a, we get a programme that we need to do. Uh, mornings a walk bike like a spin that's why I said 11.30 because I yeah. knew I could get this head and mind around it and then on the afternoon we go on a run or a sprinting and we have like a, a heart rate tracker and a GPS that they, it tracks how far you've gone and what your heart rates are and uh, on a scale as well so it's, it's great it's very advanced compared to what it probably was back in the day and obviously years gone by it, this situation has never happened so it's it's a big one, it's an eye-opener for everybody. It's made us feel like I need to have a gym now around the house instead of going to a gym, so it's crazy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. We're, we're all working completely differently. I'm trying to work on where in the house can I, can I do these 30 videos over, over the month and um, try and find yeah. as good Wi-Fi and Jessica's not running around all over the place as well, but it is mad. So yeah, uh, Bolton, how long were you Bolton for, Chris? I was at Bolton as, for four years. Uh, I had three managers there, which was 
Every manager was different. I had Sam Allardyce, who was who could be anything, could be crazy, could be nice and calm. Didn't really come out and watch you train. I had uh, Sammy Lee, who was always outside tr- watching you train, he, more of a coach come manager. And then I had Gary Megson as well, who would give us me a Premier League debut and really kind of looked after us really well. And the, the whole team took us under, under the colour kind of thing. And I went from there, it just progressed through me enthusiasm really more than anything. Yeah, and, and that certainly comes across in the way you play the game. And that, again, that's an interesting one from a mental point of view. We, sometimes we connect with different people, don't we? So I, I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to tell me which one was the best manager and which one was the worst. Yeah. Although if you want to, I'm more than happy for you to say. But some people we like, some people we don't like based on their personalities. Which type of personality in terms of a manager did you kind of you know, get closer to than the other two? Yeah, I think obviously coming through with being with Bryce, like being quite an aggressive manager, uh, not scared to see what he needs to say. I think that probably I took to that at 16, 17, and then I've, I've liked that ever since. So I've got, I had a Sam Allardyce who was very like that. I had a Gary Megson who was very like that. And now my manager at the moment, uh, Chris Wilder, he's exactly like that as well. So likes being on the training ground, likes screaming and shouting and tells you what kind of person you are if he needs to tell you. So, uh, I think that kind of manager, the one who progressively, but also can put an arm around you if he, if he sees you struggling. Uh, I'm not kind of the manager who, I don't like the manager who likes everybody because you can't be like that in football. I think you have to have your team and that's your team and you work from there. And if somebody needs to come in, they're trusted and they're happy to do that. So after Bolton, straight to Blackpool, was that under Ian Holloway? Yeah, sorry, yeah, Ian Holloway as well. Uh, so I went straight there. Very enthusiastic man. Uh, brilliant in what he what he did and what he what he succeeded to do. Uh, he got promotion to the Premier League at Blackpool, probably the, the probably the, the club that would never thought would ever get into the Premier League, and he did that. Uh, truly amazing. Uh, he was a he was a good manager, good man manager. Uh, liked to have meetings every morning. Some boys could get bored of them, but very chirpy, very laughter. I think he needed that at Blackpool at the time as well because it bringing in players that he was bringing in from different clubs. They, they seen what it was like to be at the highest level and come to Blackpool in the Premier League, but it needed so much doing behind the scenes. Yeah, Fab, we run a leadership programme that looks at how do you take the world of sport and translate it into business? And you're right in the fact that, one, you need the right team, but two, you need to build the right environment. And Ian Holloway's got a, a historical career of building environments around fun and being a little quirky, hasn't he? Yeah, I think that's why that's why he succeeded so much. I think every chairman would like his character, his characteristics, the how he how he plays football on the pitch, and obviously his environment that he likes. He likes the positive uh, vibe around the place, and every player that he brought in was a bit like me. Really, like have has a laugh, has a joke, but when it's serious time, we have a serious time as well. And I think that's why he had so much success. No, oh, cool. Um, so you had some good times and bad times at Blackpool. So yeah, definitely. good times obviously getting promoted to the Premier League. Tell tell me about some of the bad times though. Yeah, bad times. Uh, injury. I broke my leg there. Uh, had have a. I was out for about. Well, I got told six seven months, but I just couldn't get fit for a full year. Really, uh, that was in the Premier League season. So I've had my dream move there in the Premier League. I'm thinking I'm going to play really well. Maybe get that dream move somewhere somewhere else, and then bang, I break my leg in a reserve game. So. I was out for nine to 12 months uh, trying to get fit. Obviously, going back to what I said, didn't really have the environment. Uh, the gym wasn't great. The physio was okay, but we didn't really have the facilities to use up what we have now. So it was kind of, there you go, look after your programme and do your best to get fit. So it was a really low point in my me, in me, in me career. Uh, going through a move as well, moving from Manchester to Blackpool as the house move was tough because my wife loved it in Manchester. Realising that she had to come to Blackpool with me was tough as well. Yeah, so how did you find that resilience and how, do you, how did you kick on from those, I guess, little dips in life? Uh, I think what happened with me there was there was a manager change. Ian Holloway left, obviously took the club as far as he could in the championship and then I got a, a chance who had played under this manager a few times called Steve Thompson, who's assistant manager at Preston now. Yeah. He uh, 
I played with him at the reserve in reserves, and he was like, "Go on, Bash, you need to come play again. You need to play some games." So he gave us a chance, and I, I just grabbed it as quick as I could, and I was like, just happy to be playing again because I didn't know where my career was heading at that point. Uh, Blackpool was it was a dark place at times, and when I started playing again, it was it was good to be back out there playing in front of fans and feeling the love for the game again. Yeah, those those transitions between being in that fear zone where you know we start to see all the negatives, but then starting to learn and grow again and come out of that and be, being a better person, being a better football player. These are the things that maybe some of the younger kids don't necessarily understand when they're first starting their career. Yeah, I think a lot of people would just give up. The, the easy way out is to give up and just stop, stop doing it. Stop doing what you love. And I think that's why you start losing the love for the game and you start losing the love of having a laugh with your mates because you don't really want to have a laugh because you're thinking you're an individual, you're a businessman in yourself, you've got a talent, but that's all you've got. And when you're not showing that talent, you think, well, what, what's the point? Where to go next? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of sports people who I've worked with in terms of that doubt when they finish the game, in terms of what do we do? You know, how do, how do I transfer the skills that I've got into business or into another life? And I guess fortunately now football players are in a slightly different financial situation at the very top of the game, not necessarily lower levels, but they don't necessarily need that. But there's a lot of sports people, you know, who are coming out of the game, who don't have the finances and just feel a little bit lost, you know, mentally. Yeah. yeah, I can tell. I can tell now, even in the last few years. I know I've just hit the top now, but every month was you got paid and a lot of that money would go and you wouldn't you wouldn't know what, what to do with it next and your, your investment you try to invest the money but you also try to get guidance of other people but you do you come out of football and you haven't got if you haven't got money saved or you haven't got the next thing that you want in life or because you only got football until you're 30 35 maybe some out of the game when they're 28 29 so it's it's only half, half your life, really. You've got another 30 years of work ahead of you. And what do you do from there? And I think that's another thing that we talk about is being resilient and go out there and get a job and not have that embarrassment of if you want to work in Asda, if you want to be a taxi driver, just doing it because it's going to bring income. Absolutely. It's also about redefining yourself because you've, you've always defined yourself as a football player. So, you know, you wake up and you go, I'm Chris Basham, I'm a football player, I'm yeah. a really football player, that's what I do. But then all of a sudden, when you can't do that, how do you start to define yourself so that you're still feeling quite comfortable and confident within? So as you mentioned there about maybe being a taxi driver or opening a pub or being a coach or setting up a business, then actually you've gone from top of the food chain to bottom yeah. of the food chain, haven't you? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's the, that's the thing that you've got to get your mind and your head around. That It's not hit me yet, but I'm slowly starting to realise. And this lockdown's helped us a lot because it's took us away from football and the game and obviously keeping yourself fit. That's what everyone does, don't they? So it's kind of took us away and it's starting to give us a reality check of what do I want to do after football and how can I, can I, can I show anything of my experiences or can I stay in football to, to nurture young talent or do I go and like off the bandwagon and just go and oh, try and buy a pub or something like that but it's something that I've not really thought about 100% at the moment uh, it's something that it's hit us right now in this lockdown period of what do I do next and I'll have to have a sit down with a, a lot of people and have a think uh, if, you, if you're interested in buying a pub I'm certainly in over the last two to three years I've been doing a lot of property investment and did the same thing I went from what I know in my career to knowing nothing so I did two, yeah. two, and a half learn, two and a half years of learning and property investment and you know, been buying Amazing. a few things, which is quite fun. And I've got a property mentor because it doesn't matter how old you are, you still need to learn. But yeah. you know, your confidence levels goes from that to that because it's all brand new. Um, but yeah, if you want to buy a pub, give me a yeah. shout. We'll have a little look at some stuff. I've got a, yeah. a property network of over 7,000 people now that we, we buy uh, things and we run things from each other. Yeah, so, that's yeah. amazing. That's, that's class. I that's mean, class. We, can call it, we can call it Chris's pub. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I think with having good people around us, agent and financial advisors has really helped me, obviously, but you have to get to that period in your life where you can have that security and people looking after you. But some people don't they, they do anything like that. They don't like people looking after them. Uh, so it, it becomes a tough, tough place to be, especially as a sports person. Yeah, I spoke to Paul Regan. He was one of the guys on the, on the Business Week. And he was talking about the fact that he just got, after the 2012 Olympics, he went into a bit yeah. of a comfort zone. 
Um, and then it was almost one day off, became a week, became a couple of months off. And then all yeah. of a sudden, he's then in fear mode again. And where am I going to work? Where am I going to get my next job from kind of stuff? So we yeah. transition all of the time. There's no straight direct. No, transition. definitely not. Definitely not. And no one's like, like my career, no one's career is but well, you get the odd one or two and that's it really. But you get a lot of like ups and downs and you never get a steady, steady away, steady yeah. away career. And obviously you know that as well. So it's, it's crazy. But just when you think you've got it nailed, something comes up and hits you in the, in the back of the arse, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah. And like, like right now we, we just took the deferrals to help out our football club and the clubs all in it together kind of thing. And, just when you feel like you're at the top of the league and you don't think anything's going to happen here, bang, here comes a deferral. And when's the league going to start again? Is it going to start again? Question marks and financial question marks over over all our heads as well. So it's, it's crazy. It is nuts. It's a mad time. Um, so we're all trying to adapt and evolve. So we then go to Sheffield United. Good move for you? Uh, a good move because I thought I could definitely step up from League One to the Championship knowing that but it took a long time, so I joined there on the Niger Club, got to a semi-final of a, uh, I think it was uh, the Cabero Cup now, uh-huh. uh, so got the semi-final of that, great year, got the playoff finals, got beat, Re- then it stepped back straight away, got beat in that, manager gets sacked, Nigel Atkins comes in and we have a play- like a, a play out of a year, a year where you don't need really to do anything. He's finished 11th or 12th in League One, which is nowhere near good enough for Sheffield United at the time. And Chris Wilder comes in and seems to change the whole environment, the place. Everybody's lifted up, makes the captain, Billy, Billy Sharp now, and Sheffield United fan. And it was a great move. And we brought in a lot of great talent and great people like, like myself and like Billy, the captain. And yeah, just gone on from there. And that was no easy way of going. The first, the first time I went there was to try and get promoted straight away, and it took three years to get promoted. So it was very tough. You've been there seven years, and what a season you guys are having this season, by the way. Yeah, that's. I think that's the main thing is that he's got his breed of talent. He's got his lads who've played in League One with him who know exactly how to play in the formation that we do, and there's no, there's no. There's, we were scared at the start because we didn't you're going into the unknown but now we're, we're really enjoying it and now we're trying to push for Europe and Champions League so it's, it's mad it is crazy we'll be fab if you guys could be successful I wasn't sure whether I should wear my um, my tie for this conversation uh, that would have been that would have been nice that would be fair yeah my, um, I did some around a conference a couple of years well it's going back a while now when um, the Malta Tourist Board um, used to right. play Sheffield United. Yeah. Um, and one of my one of my doubles players from when I used to play, he he was a Davis Cup player at Malta, but he also ran the Maltese Tour Board in this country. So I went to a couple of events there and delivered at a couple of conferences down there as well. Yeah, because we used to Sheffield United used to do visit Malta on the back of the shirt, and I think right, we used yeah. to go there for pre-season. I missed the year that they went, but the the year I joined, they had just been in Malta as well for a pre-season tour. So, yeah. It's, uh, the, the the lad said they enjoyed it. Now times have changed so much. Now it's not Malta. Now it's like going to they just try to arrange tournaments and things like that. It's crazy. Yeah, so that's where the tie came from. Um, no, we'll, you should have won. we'll not get into the football team that I support, but um, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping Sheffield United do do really well, and you know if we get back to playing a little bit, that'd be fab if you guys could get into Europe in whatever format that it's at. Yeah, another boundary that I'll be using this time is playing in front, not in front of fans. So is yeah. it going to be a positive feel? Is it going to be a negative feel? You're hearing the manager's voice, not like as much as normal, but now you can scream right across the other side of the pitch to you. So it's it's all going to be different and just getting that through, through your brain and through your head as well. If, yes, you're in a game, but it could be in a training ground. You just, yeah. just I don't guess know. A, good, a good thought process for you on that, Chris, is almost going back to your Gateshead College days. Yeah, right? Gateshead you know, College days. Nobody. That's what we all do. We, we play in front of nobody because we love the sport, don't we? we if we yeah, that's... That, you'd be fine. Yeah, you're dead right. You're dead right. Hopefully it goes well. Yeah, so if you just want to wrap this up, and thanks very much for your input today. Um, a little bit of advice for people who are coming through that system. Maybe they've you know, they've been you know, let down by an academy or they've been dropped out of a football club and they're in that position where they're not sure where they go next. Have you got any advice, three top tips that you can give them to help them along the way? 
uh, just strive for your dreams. I think uh, keep keep believing in what you're doing, and if if people around you believe in you as well, then you can't stop. You can't stop now at such a young age. Uh, learn learn about your body, how it works. Uh, your nutritional side of, of everything is so important now, and it's even more important now at the top of the level. Uh, and finally, just never give up. I think. Uh, like like I say, it's 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 hard to give up. It's hard to the hardest step is giving up. But I mean, that's the easiest way to do it is to give up. And honestly, if you if you don't give up, it's is the biggest bigger chance out there than if you do give up. Fab, and we're talking to Alison Dixon during this program as well. And and Ali's a um, a marathon runner for GB, been to the Olympics, and she she didn't really hit the international level until sort of mid thirties. Um, it's amazing. And just kept going, kept going, kept going, and hanging in, and that resilience, that mental toughness that we talk about all the time, you know, just it was because of her passion, her love for yeah. the sport. And she can look back on her career when she was 27, 28, and think, I never thought I thought I would have been. I would. This was when I was at my best, but now I'm now I'm running internationally. It's it's amazing, and such a and age is a like a fine wine, isn't it? You some, sometimes people get better with age, so it's great. Yeah, although I do quite enjoy drinking a fine wine. I'm not sure I get yeah. it with age, but I certainly get no, it with, yeah. with age as well. I think this lockdown hasn't helped me with trying out wines and stuff. I think I've been on it. I've never, I've never drank so many wines in, in, in this <laughs> lockdown, but it's just getting through every day. It's, it's tough, isn't it? It is, and it, it, it just becomes a new normal. We adapt, and you know, we just try to be a little bit better every day because that's all we can do, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. But great meeting, and thank you for having spending the time to have a chat with us as well. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. Thanks, Chris. What we'll do is, um, for everybody out there, we will put a PDF in terms of Chris's top tips. Um, we'll also make sure that you subscribe, you you like the YouTube channel and everybody who's going to be on over the next 30 days. Because everybody's giving their time away for free, there is a donation to the RBI charity, which is also on the link. Don't have to do, don't donate anything, but if you want to, that would be fab. And Chris, please share this with all of your network. And thank you very much for giving me your time and everybody else your wise words of wisdom. I will do. Thanks very much. See ya. Yeah,